The test came back positive. The doctor came in and threw my file down on the desk and said, well, you might as well just go home and get your things in order. I've been taking a lot of medication over the years and accumulating a lot of bottles. So rather than turning it into landfill, I thought I'd um, turn it into art. This has become one of the new media of uh, my practice. When I was first diagnosed with HIV, it was a death sentence. The infecting HIV virus attached to the cells in my immune system, causing them to recreate the virus's genetic material. I knew that as HIV infected more cells, AIDS would inevitably appear, as I would no longer be able to defend my body from infections. Then new drugs were developed, and they suppressed the virus in my blood. I'm now able to live a long and healthy life. I'm considered to be undetectable. It's impossible for me now to transmit HIV to anyone else. This is the miracle that we've all been waiting for. We know how to end HIV AIDS. We finally have the way. We just don't have the will to get there. Made the right decision to fight AIDS and now to create a generation free of it. We dare not walk away. There is a generation in jeopardy, but we have reason to have hope, reason to believe that we can, in fact, reach our goal of ending AIDS by 2030. 90% of the people tested, 90% of those people on treatment, and 90% with uh, undetectable viral load. We can end this pandemic. We can beat this disease. We can win this fight. This should be an AIDS-free world. We don't need a cure. We don't need to wait for a vaccine. We could decrease the burden of HIV AIDS globally by greater than 90% during our lifetime with nothing much more than we were already have. And we're not going to do this because we don't want to. I approach my work in a format that's very much like a record keeper. I think it's important to describe the times that I'm living in. Well, I don't think there's a, a more chilling word to the human um, vocabulary than plague. It usually comes at a time where we have no idea where it's coming from. No idea how it's transmitted. But what's interesting is how a plethora of misinformation and myths and blaming that um, seem to be really endemic to the human experience. We're very much like walking collages. We have a little bit of an understanding of politics and of, of ethics and all these portions that we carry that we think we understand are always changing. I think that's really responsible for why we have challenges in uh, understanding one another. I quickly learned that if anyone thought you were or you were associated with someone living with HIV, you were very quickly ostracized and being spoken about. The secret to making a good biscuit is to not overwork your dough. If you work it too much, it gets tough. And follow the recipe. Now, was that two or was that three? We're gonna hope it was three. My original career was as a journeyman baker, so this was where I started my world. Anytime I make these and people have them, they go, oh my God, these remind me of my grandma's biscuits. 
And so anything that makes you think of home and family can't be bad. I got my HIV status given to me at Foothills Hospital in a little tiny room by Dr. John Gill. And he basically said, we've got your test results back. They've come back positive. And my response was, yay, great. And that was my lesson in medical practice, that positive in medical terms is not a good thing. And my only question for him was, how, how long? <laughs> because that was the reality, how long? And he wrote on the blackboard, three to five years. There was amazing confusion when the epidemic first arrived. This disease is going to be with us for many, many years and decades into the future. The situation will only get worse in the foreseeable future. Perhaps in five or 10 years time, if we have a vaccine, then the situation might start to improve. But this virus is with us and it's going to stay with us for many years to come. Fear was rampant. What we knew about HIV was limited. In three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. But if not stopped, it could kill more than World War II. I went to what's called an ICAC conference, which is a huge American uh, uh, infectious disease conference. And there were four presentations in a row by world's leading experts. One mapped where new AIDS cases were being seen with petrochemical pollution. The next speaker got up and said, no, no, no. It's related to sexual stimulants that damage the immunity. The next chap came up from Paris and said, look at this strange fungus that we're finding in patients with AIDS blood. We think that there could be something in the water supply of these big cities that's grown because of climate change that's proliferating and causing immune suppression in certain communities. Confusion and a lot of fear because it was quickly recognized this was a very, very serious and fatal medical condition. Before it was renamed AIDS, it was called GRID, which is gay-related immunodeficiency. So right from the beginning, there was this association with AIDS uh, with gay men. When you're dealing with a new syndrome like that and you don't really understand it, a lot of the misunderstanding, not only regarding AIDS in general, but regarding the entire homosexual population and how they may have been uh, uh, the early victims of this particular disease. And as there I didn't seem to be this sense that HIV was something that was going to become global and affect millions of people. And I think that really stymied a lot of the early research and certainly the support for people living with HIV and AIDS. I had a patient in the 90s before there was effective treatment. So one day I get a phone call from his mother. Dr. Montana, I wanted to share with you some good news. I said, yeah, what, what is it? My son died. But, but he didn't die from AIDS. He had an accident. And, and I was, to me, that was an incredible realization. The family was happy because he, he didn't die from AIDS. But he died 40 years ahead of time. But that's to show you the powerful stigma when it was all, it was all so frustrating for me. The way media covered HIV and AIDS, it, it definitely had a homophobic tone to it. The major problem in the world today is not AIDS, but homosexuals and homosexual travel. We've got to close the borders to homosexuals. I just remember God's wrath on homosexuals and statements of this is, this is what you get for the lifestyle you've chosen to live. There are uh, all forms of stigma, discrimination, uh, uh, prejudice uh, that affects our work. We were always getting beaten up. We were always getting bashed. It was, it was um, um, a really a dangerous time. 
The news that Rock Hudson, in fact, has AIDS generated new interest in that deadly disease today and, no doubt, new fears. British rock star Freddie Mercury died Sunday of complications from AIDS. This is an epidemic. This is the Black Plague of the 1980s. And you think it could never happen to you? Whether it's a drug addict or an alcoholic or someone who's living promiscuously as far as his or her moral life is concerned, uh, we pay the price when we violate the laws of God. This was the cusp of the wave of social unrest from disinformation. The Soviet Union decided that it would spread disinformation in the West regarding AIDS. And the idea was to spread rumors that this could be a virus engineered by the CIA. It was customized to affect only gay men or Africans, that the treatments didn't work. For those of us in the field at the time, we remember, this just doesn't ring true. All the characteristics and the credible science suggest this is not correct. My children, uh, who are currently in their 30s, uh, so they were born in, their, in the 80s, in grade school, uh, uh, coming home and, and sharing with me the fact that they were being asked by others, teachers or whoever, why is your father doing this work? This painting was when I was at my worst. I just come out of the hospital and I was fighting for my life and trying to get drugs from Health Canada. Uh, it wasn't going that well, it wasn't very encouraging, and so the working title for this painting is um, My Government is Trying to Kill Me. We were fueled by a lot of anger and hatred for um, just being um, disposable. I absolutely believe that um, being an artist and activist are hopefully um, the same thing. One feeds the other, feeds the other, feeds the other. In the early days of the HIV epidemic, gay men were the community that were very hard hit by HIV, by AIDS, and they were the initial community that responded, demanding attention for this virus. There was a real sense that governments had failed us, the healthcare system had failed us, and so we needed to get out there and, uh, and, and make noise. Today's demonstration is the latest of many staged by the militant group ACT UP, which has gained increasing influence on AIDS policy. ACT UP started in the United States, in New York, and then it spread to other cities, and it actually went global. And it stood for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, and it really was a direct action volunteer run. We're going to challenge governments. We're going to do die-ins. We're going to do sit-ins. We're going to sit in government offices until we can actually speak to someone who's going to make some change. I am so sick of hearing about our tactics offending people. Uh, the Vietnam War was not ended by people being nice. Uh, nice people walk into gas chambers. Constructively use community engagement and activism can be very helpful. HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. It helps focus research. It helps focus politicians on the need for what is felt by many people to be important. The first candidate drug for the treatment of HIV emerged. The company looked around the world, various places, to, to, to place the drug for clinical trials. In Canada, St. Paul's was the natural place to go. And the West End uh, was the heart of the epidemic at the beginning of the epidemic. In the early days, uh, St. Paul's was one of the first hospitals to consider treating people with HIV. Well, in the beginning, no other hospitals would take people with HIV. So they were all sent from Lionsgate in uh, West Vancouver, North Vancouver, uh, from the general. They weren't interested in uh, people with HIV, so um, St. Paul's took it on. You'd go into uh, the clinic and you'd see so many people that you knew in various stages of dying. 
some that you could tell they weren't going to be there next week, or some that were newly diagnosed that were terrified and trying to swallow that. But through it all, um, it was really, really difficult to be surrounded and be reminded of the progression of the disease. But it also created a solidarity. We were sheltered from stigma there, but there was a lot of self-stigma too. Self-loathing and so on that we carried with us. AZT came out 86, 87. I had a lot of friends that had a very hard time with uh, AZT. And because of that, they stopped doing uh, Western medicine, unfortunately. AZT being the first um, truly broadly used medication at the time um, had profound side effects for me. Dizziness, nausea, wicked headaches, vertigo. Almost lost my hand in a mixer at work one day, and that was the defining, I'm done with this drug thing. Like, the diarrhea and the headaches were, were already enough of a debilitation, but I, I told John, my, my doctor, I told him flat out, I says, I felt fine until you gave me this to take, and I'm not gonna take this. At time, we're faced with the dilemma. Can I tolerate taking these drugs that give me diarrhea, or do I not take them and die? It was grim. I mean, you see someone 23 and you tell them they're going to be dead in six months. That's tough. Even if it was winning a battle of stopping someone going blind, that's a win. If you can't fix the underlying problem, but you can keep them with vision for six months, celebrate that. We scored lots of little things where, you know, we kept people alive so their family could visit. We kept them in housing where they were happy and could die with dignity. Those were little wins, and we scored a lot of little wins, although we knew we were losing the bigger battle. Eventually, uh, you have to go through all your assets. Um, and like I said, it wasn't hard to get rid of all of those things knowing that there wasn't anything being offered as a future. When it was told I was gonna to be dead in three to five years, I cashed in my insurance policies and everything because that was the advice we were all being given to do because it wasn't gonna go anywhere anyway. Eventually I couldn't work anymore, so I lost my job and savings are gone. Yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, financial damage. The reel to reel belongs to my husband, and the records all belong to my husband as well. I used to have a collection of records, but I got rid of those when um, I was making my final arrangements and planning my goodbye, and as I was told to do. So now I get to listen to all my husband's records instead. And, and he's got a very eclectic collection of records. He grew up with the early country folks, and I did not. <laughs> we had a problem with people who had developed intolerance or side effects to the medication, so we needed to develop new strategies because just having two treatments alone uh, was not, not enough variety to ensure that you, 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 and you uh, would have your needs met. perception was that these drugs were toxic, uh, didn't derive enough benefit, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the reality is, yes, all that was true, but, you know, you had to start somewhere. By the end of the year, 1995, we knew we have a breakthrough. It really contributed to defining the new standard of care that became highly active antiretroviral therapy, or the triple drug cocktail. I got a phone call from the clinic saying, hey, this we've got this new clinical trial drug. It was right after the um, uh, the Vancouver AIDS conference had happened. So um, I got a phone call from the clinic um, asking if I was interested. I said, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm being told to plan my end. I think I started taking medications in September. My mother had come out that summer um, and had seen me at my worst. By November, 
I called my mother and I told her I weighed 176 pounds. It was profound. Um, I was walking my dog. I was shoveling my sidewalk. I was able to climb my stairs and use my bathroom upstairs for the first time in a year. She said she wouldn't believe me till she saw me. Um, so when I flew home in December, I walked right past her in the airport and she didn't even see me. She was looking for the kid she saw in September. and didn't even recognize the sun she saw in November. So I turned around in the airport and said, what? I gained a few pounds, you don't even recognize me. And uh, she just, she just, she just cried, she just cried. The term miracle was being used. Um, I'm not a faith guy. Um, science miracle, whatever. Whatever, don't care. It worked. It worked and it opened the door to, to newer, better, greater medications. Um, took death away took fear away, took anxiety away, put hope on the table. People who are on effective treatment have a lowered amount of virus in their blood. Undetectable simply means that the amount of virus is so low because it's of the effectiveness of the treatment that it cannot be detected. You take a pill every day and it basically like kills all the copies of the virus in your blood and um, that means that you can achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. I know that my treatment works, that I'm now, my virus is at a level that's undetectable. And because my virus is undetectable, I'm not transmitting HIV. I cannot transmit HIV. Living in the, the shame of um, perhaps infecting someone else is a huge part of um, this, this self-stigma that I used to st deal with. Being undetectable not only gives you uh, your life back, but it makes you feel um, part of the community again. And this message is just now starting to be heard, and it's been true for four years. Um, and it needs to be screamed from the rooftops. And it, it's not. You equals you is based on tens of thousands of um, instances where someone is living with HIV and someone is not living with HIV and the virus has not been transmitted. We've interviewed many people, both living with HIV and HIV negative, about their understandings of undetectability. And many expressed a kind of resistance. This is what I've talked about as a too good to be trueness of the idea. How could you really equals you? Bruce Richmond is an HIV activist who probably started about four or five years ago looking at the science behind you equals you. And he faced many of the same hurdles that were faced in the early years where public health officials were like, we can't share this information with people. We can't trust them to, to use this information in the appropriate way. And he actually galvanized people all over the world to force governments to actually say, look, this is the science. Heads of clinics and medical associations would say, we don't want, we know this. We agree with the science 100%. And on an individual level, in our clinics, we will share this information, but on a public health level, this could be dangerous. There are those that will be listening to this going, they agree with that. Right, um, and that's based in 35 years of fear of, of the, uh, HIV and of people living with HIV. There is a window of opportunity before us, a window through which we can very clearly see the end of AIDS within my lifetime. We cannot afford to let the window close. Amen. If our efforts flag, Drug resistance will surface. Mm -hmm. 
transmission rates will rise, and this disease, which knows no boundaries, will once again become a ruthless pandemic with disastrous and far-reaching consequences. Having been exposed to so much suffering, death, transmission, etc., uh, stigma and discrimination, people with HIV, and knowing that I can stop all of this uh, and not happening, uh, it was very painful. We begin with a major medical study that could be a game changer in the global fight against HIV. It finds that drug treatment alone may be the best defense to stop the spread of the virus. The findings are published in the medical journal The Lancet, and it could have huge implications around the world. Basically, uh, we had found that if you were to take uh, everybody infected with HIV and then offer them treatment in a way that it would be sustainable, you could eliminate AIDS, you could eliminate premature death related to HIV AIDS, and secondarily, for no additional investment, you could actually stop HIV transmission altogether. Treatment as prevention often is talked about just in relation to anti-HIV medication, but really I think it's important to think about it in the broader sense, testing um, access to antiretrovirals and the ability to maintain access to those antiretrovirals uh, and reach an undetectable viral load. Treatment as prevention, I do want to say a word about Julio has been talking about this for a very long period of time. Now we have absolute confirmed data that he was right all along. Treatment is prevention. What is lacking is the political predisposition to get it done. And we see this vast array of humankind unnecessarily suffering that you could stop it. Why in God's name wouldn't you throw your life into it? Seek and Treat aims to decrease HIV disease. There is a large segment of the at-risk population who are not at all connected to the health system. Through Seek and Treat, we are going to actually support and provide antiretroviral therapy to those people wherever possible. I work for Vancouver Coastal Health for the STOP team. And stop. Some people say seek and treat. I like to say support and treat for optimal prevention. Oh, hi, it's Carrie calling from the stop team. Just um, working with Jake, and he's anxious to start his ARVs. Have they arrived yet? We have outreach workers, we have outreach nurses, and outreach so social workers. This outreach program works. I mean, the, the biggest piece is the relationship building. I've left a message. You're, you're supposed to start this week. We've got a good team of people that there's no judgment and there's what you call unconditional support. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. We connect people to services, to doctors, and ideally we get them on antiretroviral medication. But we don't always. The idea is to support them where they're at. In this job, you do see so much injustice, so much inequity. People are criminalized for having a substance use disorder. The stigma, the shame that you see. I had one client who refused to go on, on antiretrovirals right until the end. She called me and said, I'm gonna go on the meds. Don't get too excited, Carrie. So I said I would phone her every day to remind her. A few weeks later, I discovered she wasn't taking them. And I said, why am I phoning you every day? And she goes, oh yeah, sorry about that. I visited her, supported her in her death, told her I loved her. Being with her at the end was as much for me as it was for her. I feel like I am making a positive difference in people's lives, even if it's just having a relationship. And I feel really privileged that people let me into their lives. They just said you're on the wait list. Oh, really? Yeah. That's good. Did okay. you stay there last night? Oh. I haven't seen there in two days. Where have you been staying? Uh, nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Especially when someone's homeless, then they don't get their meds regularly. And that's a big thing with antiretrovirals is adherence. You have to be taking them regularly. So it's actually more crucial to connect with people when they're homeless.
Do you have any recent photographs of Christian? In August, he'll be one, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't think I have seen this one. He looks great. Michelle had a baby about a year ago. We kind of helped her through that, made sure she was on her uh, meds and got methadone and got good care while she was pregnant. So the baby's born all right, like he hasn't got HIV. I think it would be great if you went up um, and saw your dad and, you, and Christian. So we can help with that. All right, see you next week. The first thing people want to know is like, well, how did you get it? As if the mechanism of acquiring HIV gives people a license to decide whether they need to care for you or, or whether you, you're to blame or, or, or sort of where to place that blame. A lot of people are surprised to know that more than half, about 52% of all people living with HIV around the world are women. The global face of HIV is a woman's face. So we can call the treatment center? Yeah. Our team has been working with Sienna since October of 2018. Um, she came to us after she moved here from Saskatchewan. She came to be with her partner at that time. Try to tell your partner you're sick and then it go, he goes and spreads it around like, and leaves you. And you're just trying to be clean about it, right? He, he was the one that gave it to me. We were together since we were young, right? Mm -hmm. And then he just passed away in the 2015 of HIV. We see that Indigenous women have the highest death rate in Canada uh, with HIV. They're last to go on to the medications. According to Health Canada, Saskatchewan reserves have an HIV rate 11 times the national rate. Those are incident rates that are equivalent to an African country uh, such as Nigeria. One of the challenges that we face, particularly for people who may live in smaller or more remote communities, they may not have the same access to HIV testing. HIV has no boundaries, and people need to realize that it has no barriers between cultures or wealth or where you live. Anyone can get it. We have to talk about sex, and we have to talk about homophobia, and we have to start, we have to address things like sex work laws in different countries or different settings. We have to talk about harm reduction policies. Those are the spaces um, where, you know, we, we, have to, we have to push for progress, but we all live in the societies um, that, that, you know, the society, cultural norms, expectations, we all live in that soup. And the ARVs, how, how are you feeling being on your ARVs? Well, I'm glad that I'm back on them because yeah. it does help me in my blood work and yeah. Yeah. Makes you feel a lot as sick as they normally would. Yeah. How are you feeling in general after being on them? I'm feeling good about it. Yeah. You mentioned you bumped into your sister the other day. Yeah, I haven't seen my sister in six months and she was really worried about me because she didn't know where I was. Oh, wow. So she's happy that I'm still alive. Yeah, I bet. What's keeping you on the, the meds this time? What's helping? My family and, and stuff because I know how I would have hurt them if I wasn't on them. I want to be there for my nephews and nieces, so. Oh, you're an uncle. So I, I got to be really careful of what I'm doing. I'm slowly thinking about going to recovery again, but not right now. Yeah. I'm not ready yet. Well, we're here to help when you're ready. <laughs> so over time, you get to know people really well, and they get to know you there becomes a level of trust, I feel like it's easier to say, well, hey, how about being on your meds? Or how can we support you with being on your meds? We really need to be flexible in our response, but the bottom line is everybody deserves to have access to treatment if they want to have it. That's awesome that we got blood work today. We yeah. should get the results back, yeah, hopefully, hopefully by good. Yeah, I think it will be. You've been on your meds. Access to testing, access to HIV medication if you're living with HIV, access to HIV medication if you're at risk for HIV for prevention is not equally available in Canada. This should be a national disgrace. Any kind of change in government usually stops funding usually stops understanding the model that's been exhibited in Vancouver with um, treatment as pre prevention um, is universally accepted globally.
But as you say, um, it's, it's not being enacted uh, nationally to any degree. If you look at the investments that have been made uh, uh, to support uh, HIV campaigns around the world, uh, things were coming along reasonably well up to 2008. Uh, but when the recession hit, the global communities found a very reasonable excuse to say, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't continue to invest at the same rate. The money dried up and never came back. The value of antiretroviral therapy economically is it keeps someone healthy. It stops them transmitting HIV to other people that would incur extra costs. It keeps them in the workforce paying tax. So the economic argument to keep people healthy is very compelling. It's been tough. It continues to be tough. Uh, institutional leaders will tell you how much and they support us, how proud they are of our work. I beg to differ. I'm bitter about it. Uh, it's been a tough going and um, I'm, 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 I'm not going to give up. Okay, let's do this. I'll pop that up just a little bit more for me. I have to take seven tubes worth of blood. Okay. If they're not down with something, they don't want to do blood work, they don't want to get their wound care this day, that's fine. Like, I just keep showing up. And until they're ready for me, that's when I do what I've been trained to do. I, I just love the people down here. It's it's kind of like the forgotten souls like that everybody leaves behind. And I just don't want to leave any of them behind. I want people to feel like somebody cares about them. I do have a first cousin and she is addicted. She lives over in the Abbotsford Tent City and I just hope that there's somebody like me looking after her. And uh, I'll see you next week for results. Uh, I know that we're on the right track, and I know that uh, this is what needs to be done. A lot of courage and dedication to fight the fights that need to be fought in order to get these programs up and running. Hey, Jim. He's here. This is Yasmin. She's a nurse on our team. Uh, I was hoping you could show her your wrist first. Now do you want to see the worst part? Sure. The way I get treated in probably everywhere I go to do with HIV or addiction, when I have Terry with me, it makes everything just go so much nicer. I think it's the difference between feeling like a, a junkie and feeling like a person. So are you okay if I send him a couple of those photos? We should celebrate the fact that we have a strategy to go forward to conquer the single most important public health threat of our generation, it could be a lot easier if people actually uh, were uh, following their moral compass. There's my dad and me. There's my dad. Sitting in front of our nice little motor home that we used to use to go for our Christmas vacation every year. There's me and my mom on our sailboat. And that's my daughter. Those of you out there who, who think people living with HIV are a threat, we're not. Those of you who are living with HIV who are scared to take treatment, get off that fear. It's take treatment. It works. Um, you can live well. You can live happy. I never dreamed I would be going back to work full time. I never dreamed I would have a partner who I would marry. I never dreamed I would have the life I have today. I stopped dreaming, um, but that all changed, and and the world is different. I didn't think when we first met we'd ever get where we are now. No, you wrote three to five. <laughs> as optimistic as well. It was optimistic. <laughs> you were very clear about that. Five being very optimistic. I think we both should congratulate ourselves. I don't know if you know, but we're moving to injectables. Trouble with the injectables is they give you a sore backside for a few days, but you don't have to take any pills. Lasts up to one to two months, which is good. 
This has gone from a disease that was absolutely terrifying. We knew very little about it. It was taking down co entire communities to now me saying that you can live a normal lifespan and you can have babies and have great, enjoyable, pleasurable sex and you don't have to risk transmitting HIV. We need to sort of take stock and say, good, good for us, global community, that's amazing. And that took a lot of investment, right? And we got, we got here, let's not lose that investment. What a, what a waste, right? What a waste of human accomplishment. Let's let this be the last generation, you know, affected by HIV and AIDS.